first heard of, of Edward Mudge, he was described as a photographer and a wildfowler. This is a picture of him. He's significantly older than, uh, than uh, the latter part of his year than I'm going to start on. But um, people know him locally. Um, they identify well, uh, him with uh, his iconic photographs. Many were weighed into postcards and their images decorate scores of local books and websites. It was said he kept a diary of his wildfowling activities in which he inserted illustrations. I must say he intrigued me. This is another picture of him, bottom left. Possibly, well actually in a, in a sailing vessel, I don't think that's got too much to do with wildfowling. The quandary for our local history society is whether this man is worth investigating. Local societies uh, like us, the uh, Bewley History Society, have limited resources. The work's done by volunteers. It takes a lot of time to do the research and even more to write it up and present it, as we're all aware who worked in this field. Would it be worthwhile? Would Edward Mudge turn out to be interesting? I decided to find out. Records show that he was born in Southampton in 1881 to a family of tinsmiths. I'm totally sure I know what a tinsmith, well you can guess what it is approximately. He moved across Southampton Water to the Forley area, adjacent to the New Forest, in 1904. He is known to have lived in a houseboat, on a houseboat in Ashley Creek from then. This is, a this is a photograph by him of Ashlet Creek, possibly taken in 1908, which would be not long after he arrived there. Nowadays, Ashlet Creek is an environmental anom anomaly, a small muddy creek off Southampton Water. It's sandwiched between the chemical industry of Forley Oil Refinery on one side and the oil pad Forley Power Station now fortunately closed on the other side, fortunate in the sense that it ceased to be belching out large quantities of fumes into the air. Back in the early 20th century, Ashley Creek was a reed-filled creek with a tide mill milling corn. And indeed, Mudge was known to have a darkroom for developing his photographs in the attic of the mill. The mill still exists now occupied by a sailing club. From this base, he must have undertaken his photographic activities and his wildfowling, presumably, among the reeds of Ashley Creek and elsewhere on Southampton Water. From here, I'm going to be running a sequence of his, his, his photographs up to the end of the talk. They will change automatically, I hope. Back to Mr. Mudge. I arranged a couple of interviews with people who had an interest in him and found out that no one has ever been close to publishing a history of him. One of the interviews was with a local historian and the other with a woman I was told was Edward's cousin. Now, given that he lived at the beginning of the, of the uh, 20th century, um, that seemed to be at least one generation out of step. When I met her, she turned out, fortunately, to be his granddaughter, Edward Mudge's granddaughter, and she remembered him well. I remember trying to discover what wildfowling he did. Was it merely stalking the ducks, geese, and other wildfowl and drawing them? Or did he shoot them? Admittedly, somewhat naively, I wasn't sure. The historian told me it definitely did include shooting them. Bang, bang, dead, he said. And much sold the carcasses of the birds for their meat to a game dealer to supplement his rather meager income from photography. Wildfowling and photography were his passions for most of his life. When he wasn't shouting, the, shouting? shooting the fowl, <laughs> he, was, well, he was to be seen on his bicycle 
pedaling through the villages and countryside along Southampton Water, what we now call the waterside. On the back of his bike, he had a wooden box in which he kept his camera and other photographic equipment. Only much later did he have a small car. Edward served in the Hampshire Regiment in the First World War, and his granddaughter had some photographs that he took during the war. Whether he did that in a specialist role as a photographer or not remains to be seen. It deserves more research. In 1922, he married and moved to a bungalow he'd built in Forley. He had three sons. In 1936, he moved into a shop and photographic studio in Forley High Street, which operated until 1955. Initially, at least two of the sons joined him in the business, but as the years passed, they left to pursue other careers. His granddaughter said he became very set in his ways and somewhat obstinate, an example of which is his insistence on using a glass plate camera to the end of his life, even though the technology had moved on long before. His obstinacy is supposed to have created friction between the sons and their father, the story is told that after his death in 1964, one of his sons buried a large number of his glass plate negatives in the garden. The sons are all long dead now, so this can't be confirmed. Certainly no one is aware of the glass plates existing today, even though many of his prints do exist. And of course, we've been talking about local photographs and postcards. He also took pictures for individuals and families, portraits, births, marriages and deaths and so on. They are all naturally in the hands of the people who commissioned them. In all, many thousands of, he produced many thousands of photographs. Uh, someone guessed 10,000, but certainly thousands. What about these wildfowling diaries? His granddaughter has lifted the fog. There are five diaries covering different periods throughout most of his life, all focused on wildfowling, although they naturally mention other aspects of his life too. The two covering the later part of his life are in the granddaughter's possession and the earlier three in the possession of another surviving relative. The granddaughter showed me the two diaries she has and indeed there are illustrations of wildfire. Uh, not too many but, only, but, a, but a few. They are in pencil or, or, or black ink and, and some of them are very fine. Being in private collections, of course, means that access to them is very limited. But we can work on getting public access, with the owner's permission, of course. So this is where the investigation has got to. Has it been worthwhile? Is Edward Mudge proving sufficiently interesting? I am hooked on him now. I would find it hard not to continue. But I would like to hear other people's views on this. How do you make the decision on what you study? Are you happy with the way you're doing it? Perhaps we'll have time later to reflect on this. Thank you.